On Saudi Arabia, its people, past, religion, fault lines and future by Karen Elliott House explores the many dynamic perspectives of life in the Saudi Kingdom. House, who is a former publisher of the Wall Street Journal, spent about 30 years traveling to the country, meeting with hundreds of princes, politicians, activists and conservatives. In her book On Saudi Arabia, she discloses her experiences. The thing is, Saudi Arabia is not a modern totalitarian republic like the communist North Korea, but rather a totalitarian state with a fanatically conservative society. Of all the nations in the world, the Saudi Kingdom is perhaps the most distinct country from the Western world. On Saudi Arabia reveals how this mysterious country, which is a top producer of oil and radical Muslims, attempts to balance the oil revenues, the religious establishment and the restrictions on its citizens. My name is Shirvan and welcome to a Caspian Report review for the bookshelf. For thousands of years, the Arabs of Najid struggled to survive in the vast and harsh deserts. The sun and wind would drain the energy and will of even the strongest of men. In these deserts, one had to race against time and neighbor to find shelter and water. The limited amount of resources meant that it could be used as a leverage. Sometimes it was beneficial to share and sometimes you had to hide the resources in order to crush your rivals. These extreme conditions brought forth a nomadic people with a suspicious mindset. They didn't trust each other and they had even less faith in outsiders. This rough world had little room for leisure such as art and the appreciation of beauty. Thus, the nomadic Arabs developed a culture that was mostly devoid of these elements. It's important to understand that this mindset strictly refers to the nomads from Central Arabia known as Najid and not to the tribes from Hejaz, Gatif or Yemen. So why am I telling you how life was like in Najid a thousand years ago? Because geography determines destiny. The mindset of every nation is shaped throughout the centuries by its shared experience and geography. The nomadic way of life explains how the modern Saudi mindset evolved through time. It explains why movie theaters and concerts are banned. It explains the lack of a rule of law. Take what you can, and if you get away with it, then it must be the way things work. And if you think that life must be hard in Arabia, it's even harder for a woman. The Wahhabi doctrine says that men must serve God, and women must serve men. But God is far away and men are all over the place, thus the lives of women in the outside world are non-existent. However, Western women like House are treated as honorable men, so they are allowed to travel, visit and conduct their businesses. This rule is what allowed the author to conduct her research, interviews and travel throughout the kingdom. No Saudi men, let alone women, would be allowed this much freedom. However, Saudi Arabia is changing, not because the leadership wants it to, but because technology forces it to. Due to the internet, the informational barrier that existed in the country is collapsing. Roughly 60% of the Saudi population is below the age of 20, and some 50% of the Saudi youth is on the internet. For example, an estimated 5 million Saudis are active on Facebook. In essence, the Saudi youth is well aware of the situation in their country, but what keeps the youth content is the welfare system. The public pays no taxes, education and healthcare are free, water, electricity, natural gas and gasoline are heavily subsidized by the government. This massive welfare system may seem like a good idea, but not in its current form. In the long term, no state can survive without revenues and this brings forth the big question, what will Saudi Arabia do when the oil wells run dry? How will the Saudi state be able to afford the welfare system? How will Rijad introduce taxes on a population that has not experienced this concept? Far-reaching questions like these can be found in every chapter of the book. Another important subject on Saudi Arabia discusses is the dramatic failure of the educational system in the kingdom. The Wahhabi-based schools and higher educational institutions are unable to prepare these students for professional jobs. In comparison to students around the world, 
the Saudi performance is repeatedly near the bottom. Most of the Saudi students complete their educations in religious studies and not so much in academic subjects and thus have learned how to memorize information rather than how to think. This is crucial to understand because education forms the backbone of every nation. The lack of proper education is the reason for the enormous unemployment rates among the youth. And this brings forth another major problem, unemployment in the Saudi Kingdom. It's important to mention that there is plenty of work in Saudi Arabia. It's just that the youth refuses blue collar and service jobs. They want high paying jobs but lack the skills and yet at the same time they feel too good and too proud to work in the services sector. As a result, 9 of the 10 private sector jobs are held by immigrants. Roughly twice as many foreigners are employed in the Saudi Kingdom as Saudi citizens. What's more is that these 8.5 million foreigners, such as Pakistanis, Indians, Filipinos, Bangladeshis and others, are treated as second-class citizens. This hypocrisy within the Saudi society goes even further. For example, despite the lack of all kinds of freedoms, most Saudis do not want democracy but a justice system. They want a government that is accountable and the people want to speak openly about the political and economic issues that affect their lives. This all seems reasonable enough until you consider that the rule of law cannot function without democracy. You cannot choose one and neglect the other, it's a package deal. So it's not just the Saudi leadership but the entire society that needs to drastically change their mentality. On Saudi Arabia covers many more interesting subjects related to the country. We get to learn about the dysfunctional economy, poverty, corruption, the internal rivalries, the various factions and much more. One piece of advice though, as you read about the Saudi identity and culture, be careful not to draw similarities with other Arab or Muslim nations. The Saudi way of doing things is as alien to most Muslims as it is for the western world. The only downside of the book is that it's overwhelmingly negative. The truth is, despite all the problems of the Saudi leadership, the alternative is far worse. We're talking about a nation whose youth is undereducated, inexperienced and unemployed. It's exactly this group of people that is ripe for recruitment by radical Islamic groups. So despite all the negativity, the Saudi leadership is preferable to the alternative. Any extended revolt in the country, no matter how well intended, will be hijacked by radical Muslims. In this context, the domestic problems of Saudi Arabia quickly become an international problem. This final point is one of the reasons why I am recommending this book. Most people don't realize how important Saudi Arabia is. The thing is, what happens in the Saudi Kingdom will not be limited to the country, but it will affect the stability and prosperity of the global economic system. All in all, On Saudi Arabia explains not just the politics, but the mindset of the people and the government. It explains the tribal history of the country, the complicated present and the uncertain near future. Anyone who is anxious to understand the Saudi role in the Middle East will do well to start with this book. This was a Caspian Report book review for the bookshelf. Check out the playlist for more books and sources on geopolitics. I also want to thank the following people for their contributions on Patreon. And if you want to support Caspian Report to produce more content, please visit our Patreon page in the description. For now, thank you for watching and Sagol.